Allô? <coughs> okay, uh, so welcome everyone uh, to the Thursday afternoon session of Strings 2022. Uh, I also like to welcome back the uh, online participants to, uh, to this session. Um, it may not be totally appropriate for me to uh, start talking about CO2 at this occasion, so uh, I won't. Uh, but nevertheless, I wanted to point out that uh, this conference and also the uh, pleasant shades in the courtyard uh, have been and, and are an excellent uh, opportunity for us to meet and to discuss the relevant aspects of our field and also to connect the dots. So, uh, <clears throat> with that being said, uh, we have today, to, this afternoon, three talks on, um, three interesting talks on related topics to uh, string theory. And I would like to remind the speakers uh, to please uh, stay on schedule. Uh, the first talk is by Michael Walter um, on quantum information and space time. Please. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, you can all hear me, I, I think. Um, yeah, thanks very much to the organizers, uh, all the organizers, uh, scientific committee for, for giving me the chance to report on some of this work. So I was asked to give a review talk on quantum information, how it relates to uh, research in particular holography, quantum gravity more generally, um, sort of over the past several years. And uh, yeah, very happy to do so. And um, in particular, since I, uh, well, I uh, noticed over the last couple of days that every string theory is just an expert in quantum information already, so I think uh, my task is uh, successfully completed before I am even starting it. Um, so, so with that said, uh, let's jump into it. Um, what's the deal with quantum information? Um, the thing is, it's, it's strange, right? We have all these effects. Uh, we can't clone it. We can't really figure out what, what it is, right? That's the uncertainty principle. Um, we can violate balance inequalities or correlation inequalities that hold uh, for classical information. Um, there's this thing called entanglement that, that, that we have been trying to come to terms with and so on and so forth. And, and what the field of confirmation and confirmation theory is trying to do um, in, in a big part is to try to offer the right language in a toolbox to address uh, uh, these phenomena and actually not just to address them but also to exploit them to do interesting things. So for example, the uh, uncertainty principle um, right, which, which seems like a problem, right, that you cannot know two things, two complementary things at the same time. Actually, one can turn around and use for quantum cryptography. Okay. Uh, similarly, if we can uh, violate balance inequalities uh, uh, maximally so, or almost uh, maximally so, uh, we can control an, an, a quantum system so that we, we don't know anything otherwise. So this is the idea of device-independent control, device-independent crypto. And uh, likewise, uh, the notion of entanglement, of course, really, I think, has, has uh, you know, reshaped our understanding of uh, the structure of many body and many body systems more generally. So in recent years, uh, there's been exciting research, uh, I think, at the interface of quantum information, um, you know, with quantum field theory, and particularly uh, quantum gravity. Uh, so I want to um, talk about some of those aspects. And naturally, this uh, review uh, will be biased towards the things I know better. So you know, if I uh, omit things, of course, uh, that's my fault and, and not a value judgment. Um, maybe before going to gravity, let's just talk a little bit about quantum information, quantum field theory. And I guess there's two questions. One is, do the tools that we have developed in our community uh, even make sense? Do they apply to quantum field theory? And I guess this was pointed out several times this week, or for example, in a talk by, by Edward Witten, um, things that we take for granted, such as density operators, notions of subsystems, um, what is entropy, uh, a notion of approximation, uh, what's a circuit, and so on, uh, are much less obvious and, and more subtle uh, in the context of, well, in fundamental uh, and particularly continuous quantum systems. Uh, so why should one bother to do so? Uh, I think on the one hand side, uh, I guess we're all hoping to get new insights, right? So here I, I sort of flashed something. So for example, one can uh, interpret renormalization in the language of quantum error correction and try to get mileage out of this. Uh, that's this beautiful works on reproving uh, C-theorems uh, using the properties of quantum entropy. Um, that's sort of one motivation. And maybe another sort of more concrete or engineering motivation is that, you know, we, well, we uh, like this idea of building a quantum computer and, and programming quantum computers. Uh, uh, I guess the original motivation to do so was in order to simulate quantum physics. And so why don't we try to think about how can we simulate the hardest uh, physical systems around hardest quantum systems, which may well be quantum field theories or even theories of quantum gravity. So that's sort of uh, maybe two, two good motivations. 
Now, um, I guess more uh, to the point of, of many investigations, also talks we've seen one uh, concrete motivation is, of course, the various paradoxes involving uh, black holes and quantum information, sort of black holes, right, because gravity and quantum mechanics naturally come together there. Um, and, I mean, like, there's many puzzles here, but I guess the original one is, is the following. As, as we all know, suppose you create a black hole uh, from infalling matter, you watch it evaporate, you start with a pure state, so you end with a pure state. Uh, at the end, there's only radiation, so the radiation should be pure again. Uh, so that suggests that what should happen to entropy of the radiation, or equivalent of the remaining state of the black hole, should first go up, go down, right? This famous page curve. On the other hand, Hawkins' radiation, so, uh, Hawkins semi-classical calculations suggested that was not so, right? That's sort of the original paradox that, of course, has a, you know, people have addressed or tr have been trying to address in various settings. Uh, similarly, we can ask more operational questions. What if we throw something to a black hole? We watch the black hole evaporate. How and when can we decode this information? Uh, there's many more puzzles that have been proposed over the past decade or so. Well, I guess even longer. And uh, I mean, one of the things that is very, I guess, satisfying from 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 quantum, quantum information perspective is that uh, you know, many of the recent works that have have shed new light and uh, you know, really have had breakthroughs on, on on the information problem, uh, they relied uh, on, on sort of you know non-trivial and, and deep ideas from from quantum, uh, from quantum information, particularly the idea of quantum error correction. And so I'll want to partly come back to that later in my talk. Um, but let's start at the very beginning and with sort of the simplest possible toy model that I, I think will illustrate some of the things to come. So here's uh, the simplest toy model of an evaporating black hole, so I guess to Page, uh, who said, well, why don't we just model, model black hole time evolution by random unitaries? And that seems strange, right? Because if you have a random unitary, that's like one chunk of evolution. There's not, no notion of natural time. But the way to introduce time is to basically say, well, uh, the time is, you know, the relative base you can model by the relative size of... Uh, uh, so you, you have a unitary in a bipartite system, um, and uh, let's, I guess, here's a pointer, right? And you split the output into two parts. One is the remaining degrees of the black hole. The other is what you call radiation. And, um, you know, if you make, make this R system larger, that's basically your black hole uh, evaporating um, and, and radiating. Okay. So time is sort of the relative size of the subsystem R. And then uh, an easy calculation calculation shows that on, on average, and, and actually for typical states, uh, the entropy, and, and this is now a microscopic and entanglement entropy, um, is equal to uh, r roughly as large as it can be, in, you know, because entanglement entropy, the largest it can be is the minimal of the sizes of uh, you know, the B and the R subsystem. Okay? And so that, of course, reproduces exactly such a curve. Um, you know, there's, okay, there's, there's now some discussion one curve should really look exactly like that, you know, how about these corrections, but that's not, not so important, right? So the point is, this is a very simple model that reproduces some interesting phenomenon, or reproduce some interesting phenomenon, and, uh, you know, no one can, of course, go and discuss, okay, so what is, uh, what is there to be taken away from such a simple model? Uh, I think one uh, useful... Um, um, in uh, well, one useful thing to take away is that uh, is the use of randomness, right? Which which is used consciously here to abstract away complicated technical detail. Um, uh, so that's that's good. That's something to remember. I guess we also saw this in, in, in Dan's talk on, on Monday, uh, using sort of random unitaries, random isometries to to, to model complicated phenomena. Uh, the other is, of course, that it, it's all a bit unsatisfying, right? We want to really derive results in some theory of quantum gravity, not in results about random unitaries. Um, but nevertheless, one can hope that toy models such as this one and more complicated ones can help sort of pinpoint relevant principles and tools. Um, uh, so, for example, here, it, because it, the entropy here is an entanglement entropy, one could be led to the thought that early radiation should be entangled with the, the remaining degrees of freedom that remained, have so far remained the black hole, whereas later radiation should be entangled with the early radiation, thereby, therefore entropy decreases again. Um, and that's a similar, you know, a, a nice model that, that many of you know, due to Hayden and Preskill, uh, where they study black holes after the page time, so after this bump, um, and, and they find, okay, that and then there's a slogan, black hole is mirrors, right? So if you throw in, if Alice throws in her diary, it comes out soon after, sort of, you know, almost as soon as it can, uh, which relies on an interesting principle that is much more generally applicable, which is the decoupling principle from, from quantum information theory, which I don't want to go into on the slide, but it's something that appears over and over again in a sort of uh, follow-up works. Uh, so here, then, is the general plan, I think, for um, what... Uh, uh, okay, I hope the audio is better now, <laughs> at least in, okay, maybe not. Uh, the general plan uh, that we want to pursue, so we want to uh, uh, start sort of with the setting of holography, where gravity emerges from a complicated quantum mechanical system. Uh, that allows us, right, to apply in principle use, uh, I mean, because it's in the end dual to just a 
in quotes, uh, quantum mechanical system allows us to possibly apply the toolkit of quantum information theory, uh, we can sort of try to summarize what we have learned by, for instance, building toy models, building diagnostics, uh, trying to develop new tools uh, that at least reproduce some of the phenomena, like the page curve on my previous slide, or maybe give you explanatory insight. Um, and then, you know, maybe we can take what we learn from these models, uh, feed it back here, and, and hopefully there's a circle uh, and, and, you know, a cycle in which we learn more and more uh, about things. And then maybe there's, uh, you know, as a side effect, um, some of this whole uh, sort of discussion uh, will also teach us other things that are maybe uh, not just about gravity, but maybe they, it leads us towards interesting protocols uh, for quantum computers, for quantum networks, and so on. And I, hopefully I have time at the end to briefly comment on some recent developments there. Um, but I do want to start at the beginning, right? So we had this toy model of pages that didn't really have to, any geometry, um, um, but something that I think really has triggered the connection between, between these fields uh, is, is the idea that entanglement uh, is, is geometrized in, in ADCFT. So I want to briefly talk about this. Okay, I want to start from there. Uh, and so the starting point is this, uh, you know, uh, remarkable and, and beautiful formula and proposal by Baru and Takenagi, right? That, that, what does it say? Well, if you have a, so this is right, time size of ADS3. Um, if you have a, a boundary subsystem, right A, then sort of what the formula says is that, you know, modulo cutting off and regularizing things, the entropy of a boundary subsystem A is essentially computed up to 1 over 40 Newton by the size of a minimal surface homologous to this boundary subsystem. Okay. So that's the Sri Takanagi formula. Um, it's very nice, um, very intriguing, I guess, when I met it for the first time, uh, maybe uh, a decade ago or so. Um, and one wonders what it means, what it implies, right? Um, because it is very unusual, right? And so here's just a very small subset of the things that have been investigated just purely in the topic of entropy. Uh, so one uh, observation is that because entropy is geometrized in, in, in holography, uh, it implies constraints. This implies constraints both on entropy and on holography, okay? Uh, so for example, what, 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 what one found, and um, that's in some sense also how I got into this game, was that there's actually many unusual laws that are being on, on entropy that are being implied purely from the fact that entropy is geometrized, that it's not uh, entropy of a general quantum system. Okay, and one can try to organize this and interpret this, but we, we won't do that today. The other thing one can do is one can take known laws of entropy. So when I say laws of entropy, I mean, you know, really mathematical facts that are true about entropy or relative entropy for any quantum mechanical system, so in particular in the setting of ADCFT. And um, so, for instance, uh, I mean, looking at a slight generalization of entropy, known as relative entropy, which is a non-negative function, one can simply from this inequality, the fact that it's non-negative, uh, deduce interesting facts by applying the dictionary, right? So, uh, what one can do is, right, this is an inequality, one can perturb it around rho equals sigma, in first order one gets an equation, second order one gets an inequality, and these equation inequalities, they're very concrete interpretation on the gravity side, okay? So, what I want to say uh, with the slide then is, is, you know, already on this, like, simple level of entropy, uh, it appears that there's a lot to be learned by, by sort of taking, you know, looking at non-trivial things that we do know about, about entropy, about quantum information. Um, and again, there, there should, much more should be said about this topic. Uh, but what I want to talk about now is sort of to, to lead us to the next topic is to ask, you know, why, why does the Suryatakanagi formula even make sense? I mean, why, why should it be true? Um, I, I guess one answer is, well, you prove it or you do a calculation, right? And then you find that that's the answer, but maybe one can find a more uh, different, different sort of explanation. Um, and to arrive at that explanation, we have to lay, take a little detour and we have to talk about something that's known as tensor networks. Uh, which is a, a, a technique or a, um, uh, an, a, an approach that, that is well known in, in many body physics and quantum information uh, as another way where geometry and entanglement is being connected. Okay. Um, so what is a tensor network? So a tensor network is the following idea. If you have a many body quantum state, right, uh, say of n subsystems, you can think of the coefficients of this quantum state as a tensor with n indices. Um, but for many states of interest, this tensor will not be completely unstructured, right? It will have some structure. Maybe you look at low energy states. Maybe you look at other kinds of uh, you know, low entanglement states. And uh, the idea of a tensor network is to describe this tensor with many indices as a contraction of many small tensors. So in some sense, you start with localized entanglement, and then you glue things together to get a longer range entangled state. Okay. And here is, uh, okay, of course, there has to be a construction principle, sort of a picture that tells you how to glue together, and that's uh, what the tensor network uh, gives you. Uh, so here's three families that are very well known in, in the community. Uh, the first one is called matrix product states. So each of these tensors, as the picture shows, is a three-leg tensor. Uh, you contract along these horizontal legs, so there's no degrees of freedom living there anymore after the contraction, but there's these dangling legs at the bottom, right? So, so this picture, uh, together with an assignment of uh, you know, actual tensors for each uh, 
vertex, uh, it determines a quantum antibody state uh, uh, living on a one-dimensional line, right, on a 1D lattice. So all these dangling legs. Uh, so that's the generalization. Perhaps is uh, short for uh, projected entangled pair states, um, which is, uh, I guess, also coming from this interpretation. Um, uh, so here we have these five flex tensors, right? Everything's contracted except the ones that are sort of dangling towards the bottom. So this defines a quantum state on a 2D lattice. Um, on the right-hand side, that's a funny one uh, because we see that, uh, so this is a network, a graph that's laid out in two dimensions, but the dangling legs, they're only at the boundary, right? So this, so this is a two-dimensional network uh, defining a one, if you like, a quantum state on a one-dimensional system, right? 1D lattice. So that already seems tantalizing. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but I just want to say, so usually this technology of tensor networks historically, I guess it has been uh, proposed as a numerical tool, right? It sort of uh, came out of a, a DMRG and, 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 and related ideas uh, for studying many body physics, uh, so, uh, system, many body physics, uh, physical systems on, on computers, okay? Uh, but it has also you know, understood, been understood over the last de uh, decades that it's really also a, a theory tool, a conceptual tool, uh, because uh, by being able to represent your quantum state you know, by such sort of a, a building principle, so a construction principle, uh, in some sense this, uh, this construction principle gives you a dual perspective on your quantum state. So for example, what you can do is if your, your state is described in such a way, you can cut open this network and you can reason about the degrees of freedom, which we call virtual degrees of freedom, living on those bonds. And often this gives you a dual representation of what's going on. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and this is an idea that has been studied, you know, has been demonstrated in the classification of quantum phases, topological order, and so on and so forth. And, right, so that's sort of one thing. And, 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 and I guess one question, of course, is, you know, where does, like, why do I pick this picture, that picture, that picture? Uh, that's somehow, I would say, not as well understood, right? Um, but the, the basic folklore is that, you know, the geometry, the network that you fix is sort of, well, you should fix it according to the pattern, the structure of the entanglement of the many-body state that you're trying to uh, uh, express or approximate. So computing with tensor nexus is very similar to computing with path integrals. So, um, you know, uh, so if you have a state that's written as a tensor network, so it's similar to a state that's prepared, say, by Euclidean path integral, if you want. So computing, for example, a norm square or an overlap, right, it's just you take two copies, maybe one is conjugate, you, uh, connect, the, you connect the legs, and then, so if psi and that con conjugate are given by, by such a tensor network, it's just simply connecting those legs, right? So it's just like a partition function on some discretized uh, system, okay? Similarly, correlation function, you simply insert these operators at the right spot, um, if you uh, insert it, well, if you left them as holes, you would describe reduced density matrices and so on and so forth. So, so really the same kind of reason that you would do when you, you know, do uh, computations involving uh, states that are being prepared by, by path integrals. Um, so uh, that with this setup in mind, we can now try to uh, maybe give, give, give a complementary perspective on, on the Sturridge Takanagi form and why it should be true. Okay, so again, this is a recap. Uh, boundary subsystem A, minimal surface, entropy is computed by size of area of the minimal surface over 4G. Um, so is this mysterious? Perhaps not, because it turns out that in any tensor network, there's a very similar not equality, but at least bound on entropy. And the way it works is as follows. Suppose we take this uh, tensor network on the bottom right that I mentioned before. Uh, I think I didn't say it, but it's called Mera, proposed by Giffrey Vidal. Um, and remember, it, the dangling legs, they're all, all only at the, on the boundary, so that's where the quantum state lives that's being defined by the picture. So now suppose we split this boundary into two pieces, A, and let's say it's complement, this, this black uh, subsystem, uh, and we pick any cut through the network that separates the A boundary from the other boundary. Uh, then it turns out that the entanglement entropy and even the entanglement rank is always upper bounded by, by what? Well, it's uh, some large n, which is the number of qubits per bond, so log of the dimension of a single leg, uh, times the number of edges I had to cut. Uh, to separate A from its complement. So in particular, uh, particular I, can cut, uh, I can pick a minimal cut, and then I get the bound. This is the entropy is bounded by a large constant, and, well, by a constant, times the size of a minimal cut separating A from A complement. Okay. And what's very tantalizing and pointed, was pointed out, uh, I think, by Brian um, you know, several years ago is that you know, this picture shows a tensor network that's known as MERA. MERA is short for multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. It's sort of a, a real space renormalization ansatz based on this idea of tensor networks. Uh, and it's used for critical states. So no it has been proposed for critical states. But on the other hand, one interpretation of this very network structure right, is sort of a discretization of a time slice of ADS. And so the idea was, oh, maybe these things are connected, maybe one can understand things better this way. 
Uh, maybe very briefly, why is this bound true? Uh, very simple. Um, if uh, you coarse grain your tensor network, so you group together all the tensors sort of on one side of the real Takanagi surface of the minimal cut and all the tensors on the other side. So this gives linear maps L and R. Uh, these are linear maps from the degrees of freedom on the surface to this boundary and uh, or to that boundary respectively. Then here, uh, one way of understanding how this state arises as follows. You start with max entangled pairs, which are exactly corresponding to the edges that go across the cut. So these are sitting here, and you apply linear map on the left and on the right. Well, how many maximum entangled states do you have? Well, number of qubits per bond times the number of bonds that you had to cut, right? So that's exactly the right side term over here. And then it's an easy, uh, it's easy to see that entropy cannot increase, and even entanglement rank cannot increase when one applies linear maps uh, on subsystems. Uh, so that then shows uh, this bound very, very, very easily. Okay. And in fact, we can learn that uh, actually the bound is saturated if and only if these maps that we apply are non-preserving isometries. Uh, which, which Daniel explained on Monday. Uh, very good. Um, so this then suggests that we try to build toy models of this uh, you know, correspondence between geometry and entanglement um, using tensor networks, and, and that has been done uh, quite a number of years ago now, uh, uh, first by, by, by Daniel and its collaborators in the famous Happy paper. Um, uh, we sort of gave a little spin on it using, using a different prescription, but basically how it works is the following. Um, you try to define the, in quotes, boundary state by a tensor network that somehow discretizes, if you like, the bulk, um, say bulk time slice. Uh, the tensors you, you want to put, of course, you don't want to fine tune them, them any particular way. So maybe following pages idea, you could just pick them at random. Okay. Um, so each of these tensors is a random tensor with n qubits per bond. And then it turns out that uh, what happens in the end is actually that this bound that I presented to you before will become saturated uh, with high probability. Uh, so the entropy of A will like, not just be bounded by n times the size of the minimal cut, but it will actually be equal possibly up to order one corrections to that, okay? And uh, so it's a very simple construction, uh, but uh, that suddenly brings sort of, right, sort of, entanglement and uh, connects entanglement and geometry in sort of a very concrete way. Uh, it's interesting that it sort of works in any geometry. Um, you can ask me more about what I mean by this, so that it doesn't really rely on, say, non-positive courage or anything like this. And there's lots of variations of this construction, okay? Um, and it's, of course, interesting to ask, why is it true, okay? Um, so there's several interpretations. The first one is the one that was uh, put forward by the happy folks, but I'm slightly rephrasing, um, uh, which is the following observation. If you have a random tensor, it's almost isometric in any direction uh, where it can be. So whenever you have a random tensor and you look at you know, fewer inputs than output lags, uh, then if you think of it as a linear map, uh, it's almost non-preserving. So what you could do is you could try to orient you know, the edges on this tensor network that is hard to see in such a way that all the arrows point from this RT surface to the boundary. And that would then give you a graphical proof that actually this picture gives you a construction principle by which you build the boundary state by starting with Belpace and applying isometries. Okay. And we learned before that if that's the case, then the real Takanagi bound is actually saturated. So that's one very concrete interpretation that works well uh, whenever one can do this orienting, which, uh, for example, under an assumption of, of uh, some kind of discrete notion of non-positive curvature, uh, there's an interpretation of confirmation theory is like, which I don't want to go into, but there's a, a third one that I, I do want to mention briefly, uh, which is, well, you can just go ahead and calculate, and if you calculate the entropies, you just, you know, because tensor networks is a bit like path integral reasoning, so you just do the same calculations that you would do to, for example, prove Takanagi. So you take replicas, maybe right, you compute Rennie entropy, so you look at, say, Rennie 2 entropy, you would take two replicas of your state, um, glue them together in the right way to focus on the reduced states that you care about, and then you average over all these random tensors. And if you do this kind of disorder averaging, the statistics of random tensors tell you that in the end what you'll get is a spin model. So for each vertex, so the, right, that's where, the, that's where the random tensors lift, you have a degree of freedom that's uh, in the permutation group Sn, where n is now the order of the replica trick that you're looking at, right, so it will be n equals 2 for Rennie 2 entropy. Um, and, uh, well, the interactions in the spin model, they're ferromagnetic. This, these permutations, they seek to be the same. They seek to align. Um, the, the penalty is exactly the distance on the permutation group. Um, and uh, what one finds is that in the limit of large bond dimension, so quantum bond dimension, is corresponds exactly to the low temperature limit of these models, okay? And then it's very clear uh, that what should dominate the physics there are that, that we, well, aha, I didn't say what the boundary conditions, so that the quantity that we are computing, for example, a Rennie entropy, will exactly correspond to the fact that we, effect that we fix boundary conditions, say spin down in the region where you want to, that you want to compute entropy of and spin up otherwise. Spin down, spin up are just the two permutations in S2. Um, and then, okay, domain walls emerge, and that's, you know, uh, how Ryo Takanagi arrives. Um, and the point of this, this third approach is basically 
Pixel is very, very uh, general. So it applies to all kind of uh, you, know, you know observables that you might care about. Um, lots of, I mean, there's all these different replica tricks right, that, that, that people have uh, looked at for reflected entropies and all kind of things. And that all works very pleasantly uh, in, in this formalism. So here's a quick summary of, of what we know. So, so this idea of using tensor networks gives us very versatile toy models. I presented here the kind that relies on randomness, but, but just sort of out of personal bias. Um, uh, we, uh, toy models uh, where geometry emerges from entanglement, and well, uh, you could say we start with the geometry, but we sort of hide it by building a quantum state, but then we can recover it by computing entropies. Um, so Ryutagagi holds and actually much more, and it's easy to analyze uh, these models using basically using techniques that we know well. Uh, the question, of course, is do we learn anything? Does it tell us anything about holography? Like, what's the connection? And, and there are some negative news. For example, the entanglement spectrum of these states is not one what, what one expects from holography. But uh, what has been understood over the past years is that actually there's a very fine match between sort of the pheno phenomenology of random tensor networks and what's known as fixed area states in, in holography. So these are states when the gravitational path integral, you fix the area of RT surface to some definite value rather than having, having them fluctuate. Uh, and so that's a very fine match, including certain corrections that maybe I, I don't want to go into. Um, on the one hand side, on the other hand side, I think it has led uh, some of us certainly to, to uh, sort of dis I, I guess understand that maybe there's interesting effects going on that maybe we hadn't appreciated before. So, for example, replica symmetry uh, breaking saddles, uh, which I guess we, we, for example, in a certain for a certain entanglement measure, we found that that were, uh, were, were relevant for intense networks. And then we went uh, sort of to, to, to setting holography and, and also investigated uh, investigated those saddles. Um, there's I mean there's a long list of authors who have, who have thought about these questions. Uh, probably I forget uh, many of you in the room. I apologize for that. Uh, but there's a lot that one can say about this. Okay, so roughly speaking, fixed area states, you know, equals phenomenology of, of random tensor networks, and that I think can be a very useful uh, thing to think about. Uh, what's interesting is that some of the some of the techniques that I explain here, um, they also uh, also find applications beyond uh, uh, sort of quantum gravity research. So, for example, when one analyzes random quantum circuits, one can use very similar techniques. So, okay, random quantum circuit is like a random tensor network where the tensors are unitary, right, in some definite direction. So that's a circuit. And it's interesting because, for example, in uh, when we want to uh, demonstrate that quantum computers do something that no classical computer can do. Many of the proposals that people have put forward is to basically ask your quantum computer to run a random quantum circuit. So it's very interesting to understand when is it actually difficult and when is it easy to, understand, uh, to, to compute with random quantum or sample from the outputs of random quantum circuits. Uh, another motivation is, um, say, in quantum matter theory, people like to uh, study, for example, unitary time evolution where you insert uh, measurements in the middle and you, there's some interesting phase transitions. Similar techniques apply there. Uh, another sort of connection is maybe that it has sort of reinvigorated. Uh, I mean, basically the, the fact that, yeah, sort of this, this uh, picture, right, that the ten these tensor networks, they uh, seem to work well for critical systems and they have this nice geometric interpretation has sort of also maybe re re reinvigorated research on finding quantum circuits for critical systems more generally. And particularly when uh, 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 Isaac Kim and Brian Swingle pointed out uh, that these kind of circuits, so this is kind of a circuit rendering of the same network we saw before, uh, actually seem to have uh, interesting noise resident features that may help us um, maybe even demonstrate some of these things on, on your quantum computers. So we've, I mean, we've looked into some of these things. It seems press day quantum computers are not quite good enough yet, but uh, nevertheless, I think that's an interesting direction. Um, so, so far, so good. So um, I guess what we discussed so far is we constructed uh, amusing quantum states, right, whose entropies had a geometric flavor, but really we just constructed a bunch of fun quantum states, okay? And of course, uh, holography is much more than that. It's supposed to be duality. Uh, so we should be able to map uh, several states at once uh, or operators and, and sort of understand, you know, well, how that mapping works. And um, I want to focus on one particular uh, problem that has also appeared in the conference earlier. Uh, which is the following. Um, if we take an operator that's somehow localized in, in a bulk, uh, there should be some boundary representation, yes? Um, because, well, after all, it's supposed to be a duality. And, the, you know, some years ago, there, has, uh, there, there was, uh, people made sort of a very sharp uh, uh, prediction of, you know, uh, what that mapping should look like, and it goes as follows. Suppose you pick your favorite boundary subsystem A, then uh, this is the real tokenagi for the surface, gamma A, and now let's look at this area enclosed uh, sort of by the real tokenagi surface. So the area between the boundary and, uh, and this minimal surface. Um, so I call it little a. Okay? So I'll, I'll call it the entanglement wet for the purpose of this talk, but if you feel like complaining, you also know uh, why I do so. Um, 
And uh, uh, so the, 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 the prediction is the following, or the, the fact is the following, that any bulk operator that's localized in this blue region, in this entanglement wedge, uh, can be represented, or so goes the claim, as a boundary operator that's only supported on subsystem couple A. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, known as subregion duality, and then there's the task of actually trying, actually writing down this operator. That's, I guess, also known as entanglement wedge reconstruction, which is something that has appeared in, in the conference. Okay. And uh, I mean, subregion duality is, was proved by, by uh, I guess, uh, she, uh, Daniel, and, and Aaron. Um, and uh, using quantum information tools, I think. But right? I mean, hopefully, Daniel would agree. Um, and uh, but on the other hand, we don't really know how to do that very explicitly in sort of the most interesting situations. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to sort of show you a puzzle that has puzzled uh, some, some people in the room and, and that, that has been resolved. Uh, interestingly, and that finally will then lead us to our correction. So the puzzle goes as follows. Suppose we partition our boundary to three pieces, A, B, and C, and we look at an operator that's localized at the center here. Yes. Then this operator, its, it's support, so this point is contained in the entanglement wedge of A, B, right, because that's uh, sort of the area enclosed by the minimal surface gamma A, B, all the way here. But it's also in the minimal, uh, it's also in the the entanglement of A C and the entanglement of B C. So that would suggest that this operator phi that I put here, that I placed here at the center, uh, can be written as an operator that's supported in A B, uh, but it's also an operator that's supported in A C and it's an operator supported in B C. And the puzzle arose, uh, arises because, uh, well, these operators, they don't have any common support, right? The first one is not is acting trivially in C, that one's acting trivially in B, that one's is acting trivially in A. So it appears that this only chance is that this operator actually doesn't do anything, it's a multiple of the identity, but of course I could have started with a non trivial operator. And the resolution that has been put forward is, I mean, paraphrasing is basically the following. Uh, look, I mean, there's, for any particular bulk geometry that I care about, there's only relatively few states that correspond to it. So really, when I write these equations, they should not be interpreted as operators holding as, you know, as, as big operator identities acting on the whole CFD Hilbert space, but they should act only on small subspaces. Maybe they even just make sense on small subspaces. Uh, called code subspace or CFT Hilbert space. And then there turns out there's no contradiction. Uh, so why this term code subspace? Because this kind of redundancy that by embedding a degree of freedom in a larger dimensional Hilbert space, uh, that then we have multiple um, uh, sort of, well, equivalent but different representation of the same quantum information of the same operator, a logical operator, is exactly a feature of what we, what we call a quantum error correcting codes. Okay, it's exactly the kind of redundancy that you want so that you can protect against certain errors in an error correcting code. And to sort of illustrate this and make this concrete, uh, I, I want to show you um, a, in the, the simplest such code that, that basically models such a situation, and then we want to sort of systematize. And so, okay, this slide is maybe a little bit of a, bit, a little bit technical. Uh, so it's known as the three Q-trit code, and it tries to imitate the situation. And so the way we imitate it is we, we are trying to build a map, an encoding map, that takes a single degree of freedom, which we think of uh, as our degree of freedom sitting at the center point here, and it encodes it in a tripartite Hilbert space, which we think of as a, the boundary Hilbert space partitioned into three pieces A, B, and C. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to define a map encoding this one degree freedom into these three degrees of freedom, and the degrees of freedom, they will be Q-trits, so three level systems, just because that's sort of what the, the, the simplest example only works for Q-trits. And the map looks as follows. We take a basis state kit i, and we simply send it to a big entangled state, some of j, j, comma, j plus i, j minus i, or arithmetic modulo 3. So, so this, uh, one can easily check, defines an isometry from this three-dimensional, in quotes, bulk to the 27 dimensional in quotes boundary of this space. And here's a, the key observation that ties it together with the story in the previous slide. It's easy to see that this mapping that I wrote down here can be decomposed as a two step procedure. Uh, first, we start with a max entangled state only between A and B. So, max entangled state looks like sum over J, cat J, comma J. So, simply the, the first two letters inside this cat. Then we add the input to a summary as a new leg, and we apply a unitary that massages you know, uh, this leg and that leg together to produce the right state. And, but it's clear how to do that, right? We simply take cat j comma uh, cat i, and we map it to cat j plus i comma j minus i, right? So clearly unitary, uh, clearly works. Um, so what's the point? I mean, the point is that this representation makes it extremely clear now that in order to decode or to uncover the input to the isometry, we only need the second, the last two outputs, right? Because all we do is we look at well, we have the last two outputs. We apply u dagger. That's fine. That's nice. I mean, u is a unitary, and then we forget about the first of the two uh, two legs. We forget about the b system. And that clearly works, right? So the picture shows that um, subregion duality holds in the following sense that we can decode um, the input to the map, so this you know, toy bulk degree of freedom from knowing B and C alone. 
Um, it's also clear we don't learn anything from A, and this is good because otherwise you would contradict no cloning. Uh, the whole uh, map looks very symmetrical. I mean, it's almost symmetrical, so it's clear that the same reasoning also applies for a single out B or a single out C. Uh, so this exactly reproduces, you know, the kind of puzzle and so hopefully convinces y'all that, that there is no problem um, that we saw on the previous slide. Uh, it's also fun to compute entropy in the setting. So if you compute the entropy of A, then you just get half of a max entangled state, right, which gives you log of the dimension, a log three in this case. Whereas if you compute the entropy of the complement of BC, uh, you get, well, uh, well, the unitary doesn't do anything, so you get the entropy of, again, log three, but plus the entropy of the state that you put into your code. Okay? Uh, so whenever the entanglement wedge encloses the degree of freedom, we see its entropy, its entropy corrects the rate of formula, and otherwise it does not. And that's also what's, what's expected, right? Um, uh, in, 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 in ADCFT. Okay. So that's sort of a simple takeaway message. Um, we call this an erasure code, because from a quantum error correction perspective, we can uh, correct, or we can deal with the loss of any single of these three q -trits. Um, and it really, I think, very, I mean, it very beautifully explains, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, what, what could be going on here on sort of an information theoretic structure. And it raises the question whether we can combine these two models, right? So now we understand sort of, you know, uh, I mean, so, so what's the problem here, right? Why, why are we in a type? Well, because there's not really any geometry in the model, right? There's like one degree of freedom sitting in the bulk. So it would be very nice if you could combine this one uh, with the model that we saw earlier based on uh, tensor networks. And that works indeed, okay? And here's how it, how it goes. Um, uh, so uh, the idea is that uh, we can not only use tensor networks to define a boundary state, but we can also use it to define a map from bulk to boundary degrees of freedom, okay? So the idea is you simply extend each of these tensors, you add an additional dangling lag. So now this picture, therefore, as we explained before, right, you can now interpret this either as a quantum state of red and black degrees of freedom, or equivalently, as a map from these red to these black degree of freedoms, okay? And, well, if you had only a single tensor, you would get what we had on the previous slide in this uh, three q thread code, except that maybe now you would, would be very high dimensional. But you can, of course, now look at the whole picture, a whole tensor network, which therefore all, also has interesting uh, space, uh, spatial geometry. Uh, from the perspective of error correction, right, the language we like to use is we call these red inputs logical uh, qubits, or qubits, and the, the other ones are physical, right, the, the things that we encode into. And the idea is the physical qubits are the ones that, you know, where errors happen, and the logical information is the one you want to protect. So that's the model then, and one interesting feature of this model um, that holds just by construction without any further assumption is the following, that it makes no mathematical difference whether you change your network by adding an additional link to it, or whether you keep the original network that you had, but you in insert a max entangled state, okay? So in a very a tangible way, this implements this, this, this vision of, of ER equals EPR in the setting of these time models, okay? So in, in a sense, geometry and entanglement are really indistinguishable here, okay? Um, now, how about subregion duality? It holds that if the dimension of these bulk legs is not too large, uh, in, in one incarnation of these models, then indeed you do have an error correcting code that satisfies subregion duality. So if we fix our favorite subsystem A, this is the RT surface, now everything's discrete, right? These are the degrees of freedom uh, in the, what we call the entanglement wedge, then exactly those are encoded in the boundary subsystem. And indeed, um, uh, roughly speaking, one can coarse grain this network to get to the following picture. Uh, we have, uh, you know, U and V are the coarse grainings of this uh, entanglement wedge and that entanglement wedge, or the, the, rather the, the linear map that's implemented there. Uh, uh, the degrees of freedom that we insert in A, I, I drew them here. The ones we insert in B, I drew them here. And then there's the loads of entanglement, there's the entang same entanglement as before, which are these max entangled states that go across the cut, okay? And it's clear from this picture, if U and V are isometries, as I tried to hand wave before they are, um, that uh, you can uh, decode, uh, from the capital A, you can decode exactly little a, from boundary subsystem capital B, you can decode exactly little b, okay? And uh, I mean, uh, Dan, in an interesting uh, work, showed that essentially that uh, always has to be the case when you have subregion duality uh, for a subregion and its complement. Um, very cool, and also, of course, this, these corrections to entropy uh, we get immediately, right? If you ask, well, if you compute the entropy of A, then, well, that's the same as the entropy of these two inputs here, which is the ent entropy of the state of the, you know, these toy bulk fields restricted to the entanglement wedge, plus uh, the entropy of half of a max entangled state, which is just geometric term, which is the thing that's proportional to the area or the uh, number of legs that you had to cut um, as you, uh, uh, well, that, 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 that in, in this minimal cut between A and its, its complement. Okay. So, which is again, you know, sort of, you know, matching, matching prediction as of a couple of years ago. 
Um, of course, uh, things are actually more subtle because something that we assumed here in this discussion so far is that this minimal surface can be considered fixed for all states in this code subspace. I mean, otherwise, maybe it would not be a code. Um, so, uh, right, so if I, I drew one, one cut here, and then I thought of, uh, I thought of sort of the, the map sort of relative to this cut. But really, that's not what's going on if um, uh, you have uh, too much entanglement in the game. So, if these bulk legs are not very small, so that you can really think of them as sort of, you know, just perturbing around the same background. Uh, so in general, what happens uh, if you compute entropy in, in these models, actually you, uh, what you're led to do is not compute the, surf, uh, the size of a minimal cut and then add the corresponding uh, correction term for the bulk entropy, but rather what you have to do is you have to minimize this, this expression that is known as generalized entropy, uh, due to Nat and Aaron, um, which is uh, the joint expression, basically the, the, the area law cost, the uh, geometric cost, plus the entropic cost of the corresponding reduced state. Okay? And uh, what's known as the Quantum minimal, well, I call it quantum minimal surface here because there's no time. Um, the, 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 the quantum minimal surface is basically the choice of surface, gamma A, uh, that minimizes this joint expression, this generalized entropy. Okay. Um, and for example, if you uh, took the setting from before, right, this, this holographic code, this holographic mapping constructed using tensor networks, but you put in a gigantic and maximum entangled state between some bulk site here and one that's very far away, then, you know, if there's enough entanglement there, at some point it will become favorable to include this, uh, you know, other half of the entangled pair uh, in the entanglement wedge, that is, my minimal surface would now also have, you know, this little... Uh, uh, a circle around it, uh, and I guess that's really a toy version of these islands that have been discussed, which have been very important uh, uh, in, in, in recent works. Okay. Uh, so there's lots of things I'm sweeping under the rug here. For example, this formula is not quite true in general. It's only you know, if the entanglement is not maximal, if there's an interesting entanglement spectrum and, and other kind of uh, subtleties, then one has to work harder. And uh, the tools from uh, one-shot quantum information theory have been uh, shown to be uh, useful. Um, and and no. I guess Chris and Jeff Hack explored this by defining the notion of a min and max entanglement wedges and, and, and sort of interesting uh, uh, things in this direction. Um, but the only thing I want to say here is basically that, of course, more complicated version of these ideas is exactly what has featured in these recent uh, breakthroughs on the, on the information paradox, right? Um, of course, the other things are more complicated, whereas what's the task here, right? The task is sort of to explain, give a sort of a, a, a bulk computation that, that explains what happened, you know, to reproduces, say, the, hawk, uh, the page curve, um, or, you know, the fact that you can decode your diary if you wait for the right amount of time and so on uh, after, after having thrown it into the black hole. These are, of course, much more delicate settings. Uh, they're also not in a toy model, but in sort of, an, uh, right, in sort of proper ADCFT. And uh, they're also more delicate because it's a dynamical situation, right? So we should not use Rio Takanagi, but it's sort of time-dependent version. Uh, we should not look at quantum minimal surfaces, but at quantum external surfaces, and so on. But in some sense, I mean, I'm not giving these works justice. What is, what is happening is, right, that one uh, models an evaporating black hole, one collects the radiation in sort of a reservoir system, and one computes these quantum extremal surfaces and finds, you know, the, the right behavior. Okay, so that's uh, that's maybe maybe sort of a cartoon explanation there, uh, and, and really sort of the information theoretic structure right there. What really is going? It, it's sort of crucially this idea of error correction, uh, this idea of the generalized entropy formula uh, that sort of captures exactly what are the degrees of freedom, like what is actually the proper notion of the entanglement wedge for the purpose of these problems. All right, so here's another little summarizer. Um, so what do we know? It, it appears that, well, I, I tried to convince you at least, uh, possibly preaching uh, uh, you know, at the choir, uh, that quantum error correction is a, is a, is a useful tool um, uh, in, in the context of holography to understand you know, how and where quantum information is localized, uh, when we can hope to decode it and when not. Um, uh, it has certainly been a key ingredient in, 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 in these recent amazing progress. Um, and, uh, well, hopefully these models, these, these models that I, I tried to tell you, uh, uh, we can use as useful uh, sort of, you know, toy models to, to maybe, uh, uh, well, understand some of these phenomena, like or these, these ideas like your EPR or islands, and in a very concrete, uh, 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 in a concrete, very concrete setting, okay? And again, it's very interesting that there's not only applications sort of internally sort of to, towards uh, holography, uh, but there's also a sort of, you know, vice versa, sort of quantum information theory has been quite inspired by some of the work that has been happening and some of the, uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, by sort of this, this very curious and counterintuitive uh, information theoretic structure that we have in ADCFT um, to sort of for its own sake. So, for example, it, you know, recent works by, by Alex May and others have suggested that it's possible to do something that, that's called non-local quantum computation with very little entanglement, okay? Uh, 
Um, another idea is that, you know, and, and I guess, well, it's actually related to the first point, um, some, something that seems very fruitful is to take something that looks very simple in the bulk, uh, dualize it to get a corresponding boundary implementation, and then sometimes this boundary implementation does a very simple task in a very non-obvious way. Okay. Um, so, for example, this, this, this beautiful many-body teleportation, uh, this teleportation protocol where, from a bulk perspective, a, simply a particle moves through a traversal wormhole, uh, but from the boundary perspective, it looks quite non-trivial. And so we were quite interested in like coming up with toy models, trying to teleport, you know, sort of different different mechanisms, different potential mechanisms for this kind of teleportation, and so on and so forth. So. Looking at the time, um, indeed, we will maybe be able to pick one out of uh, a couple of possible uh, topics that one could now discuss, which are a bit more recent. So maybe I want to uh, talk a bit more about this non-local uh, computation aspect that I mentioned. So I will uh, not talk, but you may well ask me about complexity and uh, what, what maybe some quantum uh, computer scientist feeling is on, on whether it should be dual to anything. Uh, but I will not. You, you may well ask about teleportation as well. But I want to briefly just discuss uh, uh, another setting, another uh, sort of uh, playground, which is the one I mentioned before, whereby um, uh, quantum uh, gravity or ADCFT suggests that certain quantum information processing protocols exist with features that actually we don't know how to do, uh, you know, how to construct explicitly uh, and are maybe even somewhat counterintuitive. And I have to briefly explain the setting there. Okay, the setting, uh, one very concrete setting is what's known as a position-based cryptography. So the idea in position-based cryptography is that you want to use a person's space-time location as their, their credentials, right? So maybe you should only be able to unlock your safe, you know, on Saturday mornings when you stand in front of the safe. Okay. And uh, so the, ba the most basic task is what's known as position verification. You want to verify a party's space-time location. Um, and here is sort of, a, and it's easy to see that this cannot be done using classical information. Okay, with a uh, without any assumptions. Uh, so, but, but people, you know, uh, a while ago they thought maybe quantum, uh, quantum can help and the idea is the following. Suppose you want to verify someone uh, is located at this uh, space-time uh, point. Uh, so uh, space is this, uh, time is that. So one idea of trying to do that would be, you know, to sort of shoot in a quantum state, so this is in 1D, you know, just for, for, for sake of argument. You shoot in a quantum state, maybe at the speed of light from the left, some, you know, I don't know, a photon, a photon that encodes a qubit or a qubit, maybe some other kind of input from the right, maybe a choice of basis in which you should measure, uh, and then the task that the party should do is they should measure this quantum state and send the outcome uh, both ways, okay? This is like just one incarnation of, of a general idea. And the idea is, well, because there's this quantum state floating around, it seems not so obvious, uh, maybe the only way to, to actually solve this task that is being to explain here is by being located at this point. Okay, it's clearly you, you can solve it. And the question is a little bit, you know, maybe, uh, well, how could you hope to attack it? Well, maybe you have a person sitting here uh, and another person sitting here, and maybe they are colluding with each other. Uh, so one thing they could do is, right, well, maybe they could clone this quantum state, uh, shoot off one direction, one, one, one state, well, one copy of the state continues here, the other sort of they keep around, and so their uh, world lines would be kind of like this. Uh, but of course that won't work, possibly, right, because, because of no cloning. So you cannot clone this quantum input. So really what's going on on a conceptual level is we are asking this party to perform a computation with quantum input, and then it suggests that maybe there's no way to do it in a non-local way because of no cloning. Um, and probably you already read on on the slide, right? So that's actually not true. Uh, one can always trade, in some sense, locality by entanglement. And essentially, a, t a kind of teleportation makes it such that any collu well, colluding parties, in this case, two colluding parties, can attack any such scheme, not just the one I described here, if they previously share entanglement. Okay. So somehow entanglement is, uh, is a replacement for, 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 for geometry or for being at a certain space-time point. Okay. So this was discovered by, by Berman uh, friends and, and sort of uh, made more efficient by, by Gene Koenig. But the problem is that uh, these attacks, all the attacks we know, they use exponential amounts of entanglement, exponential in the size of sort of the honest computation that has to be done here. And actually, not, that's true in a very general setting, okay? Um, so uh, suppose you have a, 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 a unitary quantum circuit that you want to run, uh, you know, that two parties, well, with two inputs and two outputs, let's call this a two-party unitary quantum circuit, um, right? So, so this could be contained of uh, like lots of little gates, but there's two inputs and two outputs, 
both quantum and general, then it's always possible to implement such a uh, two-party uh, computation in what we call an instantaneously non-local way, which means that, uh, well, the inputs are, well, are, are sort of well, input at, at two different locations. They're being uh, pre-processed uh, on the left, on the right. Then some confirmation is kept, other confirmation is sent over to the other side, so one round of forward communication. And then they, it can be post-processed. And the claim is, if you start with lots of entanglement, you can fake this computation on the left. I mean, you can implement the computation on the left. Okay. Uh, and again, the best schemes that we know, based on what's known as port-based teleportation, as, as, as discussed by Beigen Koenig, use exponential uh, entanglement cost here okay, in, in the relevant parameters. Um, but then Alex May uh, recently pointed out that it's, holography suggests that there might be another way. Okay? And the idea is basically we can cook up situations where, um, let's say, our input points are C0 and C1, our outputs uh, should be at R0 and R1, then the cost of structure of the bulk allows ourselves to simply meet in the middle, uh, run the actual computation, and send the answers away. Uh, and what he suggests is that if you use the dictionary to map basically the honest protocol to the boundary, then actually the story changes because on, if you restrict to the boundary, there's no such point that's in the future of both C0 and C1 and in the common past of both R0 and R1. Okay. So that's Alex's point. And uh, so he suggests that uh, the dictionary, uh, holographic dictionary, actually allows us uh, in this very concrete way to come up with you know, such non-local implementations of any uh, computation that you just honestly carry out on the bulk, and uh, he, he roughly speaking conjectures that the amount of entanglement that you need is basically related in, 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 some, uh, in some way to the complexity of the calculation that you do in the bulk, okay? Um, and not quite of, of the unitary U, but sort of the, the simplest sort of, I mean, there's some like, something like a local gauge degree of freedom that, that you can quotient out. So it's kind of the essential, like the non-local part of the complexity. So that's uh, extremely tantalizing because it's exponentially better than what we know how to do rigorously. Uh, and, you know, I, I find that fa fascinating. You know, is it really true? Uh, maybe the boundary implementation, maybe these L and R's, L prime, R primes, maybe they're really complex, right? And that's, uh, that's what's going on. Um, you know, can one make this concrete and write down like an actual honest protocol that does not, you know, rely on any, um, any gravity. Um, what are the implications? So I find, yeah, so I, I, I just thought I would leave you maybe with this, uh, with this beautiful example of, uh, you know, I think a, a, a way where uh, I think ADCFT, uh, the ADCFT dictionary really gives rise to very, uh, seems to give rise to very non-trivial quantum protocols. Okay. So that's, uh, that's it. Uh, so I uh, uh, hope to have convinced you that, uh, well, you guys pose lots of challenges and puzzles and you know, like paradoxes. Um, uh, that confuse us. Um, we nevertheless uh, try to, to think about them and, you know, maybe propose tools that we either know and, I mean, even more in our tools that we actually did not know. Uh, we learn and, and try to absorb and, and try to give back uh, by, by proposing, you know, tools and, and, and uh, diagnostics and models. And I think it's really interesting. I think, especially over the past years, we really think this has been completely gone both ways. And we have been confused by lots of interesting information theoretic and, you know, quantum computation structure that has, that has come out of I mean, that appears to come out of the, the correspondence. Um, so, yeah, so thanks a lot for your attention. Um, happy to take questions. Thanks, Michael, for the nice uh, overview talk. Um, are there any questions? And, and also, if there were any questions on this remote island B um, that is uh, perhaps entangled to us by a classical video link, uh, Someone, if there were any questions, if someone finds a way to transport them to us. <laughs> but anyway, please go ahead. Yeah, in, in, in your talk, the space-time dimension did not mention almost at all. Can you comment uh, what is the dependence mm -hmm. on the space-time dimension? Yeah, so, um, so the dimension of the, sp I'll say space and not space-time, uh, the, the space uh, that I drew, uh, in some sense, I mean, I drew these two-dimensional pictures, but there was nothing special about two dimensions. Um, and also not about any kind of curvature a priori. So in, in principle, for example, these random tensor mo network models, they, they work in a for any graph that you start with. But then, for example, what, what, where the geometry comes in there is kind of how high do you have to crank up these bond dimensions so that, you know, the statistics of random tensors gives you the right result. And I think there is somehow, I mean, there's more that one could say there. But in principle, it all really works on the level of graphs and networks, and you can sort of uh, pick. Um, I, I thought the happy card was specific in ADS3. 
Excuse me. I thought the half day discussion was specific. Oh yeah, that, that's right. But I think it's, I mean, as, I mean, I, I interpret the, their idea certainly as general, and I think maybe some of the proofs they would only apply, you know, for for graphs laid out, you know, in some like you know embedded in some surface with non-positive curvature or, or something like that. But I mean, so these random tensor network discussions they work more generally, and I'm sure one could also give you know uh, an I, analysis. I also thought yeah. the networks are only known to be a base in two dimensions, in higher dimensions, not known whether they form a basis. Uh, excuse me? I thought that the, the, the networks form a basis in two dimensions, but it's not known whether they form a basis for wave functions in more than two dimensions. Um, so, not, so, not, so they always do, but in a trivial sense, that by, because you can crank up the bond dimension of these bonds that you don't write that these virtual degrees of freedom. Um, and, of, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but in, in principle, that, yeah, that's no problem. Basically, you can do a Schmidt decomposition, right, and then uh, maybe you just put everything into the degree, in the virtual degrees of freedom. And in these random tensor network models, of course, we, we look at the limit of large bond dimension. So there's no contradiction here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, in 30 seconds, can you just tell us the main message about quantum complexity that you were not able to show in your talk? Uh, did I understand correctly that you asked me to talk yeah. about the part I didn't talk about? Yeah, but just ah. very briefly. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, so this is, a, again, I, I mean, I didn't, uh, so this is sort of other people's work that I want to comment on. And so it's, it's about, right, we, we, we heard two talks, I think, on Monday, right, on, 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 on complexity. And then I guess it all started with Lenny's uh, proposal that, or I guess his observation that if you look at the two-sided eternal black hole in ADS, right, then the volume of this wormhole seems to grow for really long times, not clear what the natural dual quantities are. He proposed it could be a circuit complexity of the boundary state that keeps on growing. And some of the intuition being, right, that the um, dynamics is so chaotic that basically if you evolve for a long time, which is the same as evolving for a constant time, many times. Uh, basically, there's no shortcuts in this. Okay, so that was maybe the, the brief summary there. Um, so what's interesting, I think, is, uh, okay, I mean, and, and there has been lots of interesting investigations, right? People have computed many things. They have asked, you know, also in the quantum information world, do even, do such unitaries even exist? Uh, and so on and so forth. So Shira and, and Vijay s spoke about this. I want to, I wanted to briefly comment on, on a different work by, by Adam uh, Bouland uh, and, and collaborators, uh, where they made the following point. It, it appears that, uh, well, from a sort of the naive perspective of, you know, someone like me or maybe a computation complexity theorist who doesn't know so much about gravity, it seems that volumes are really easy to compute uh, or comparatively easy to compute or estimate. But complexity, we do know, is, very, is a very difficult concept. Uh, so it's difficult if, if you hand me a circuit to, and you ask me what's the minimal uh, circuit complexity, for example, or you hand me access to a state and you ask me what's the minimal number of gates I need to prepare that state. That's very difficult. And one concrete example is that there's something called pseudorandom uh, ensembles of states. So these are states that cannot by any efficient computation be distinguished from how random, but they are not how random. Okay. So, um, so there's ensembles of states that look alike if you, if you don't have enough power to, you know, if you're bounded to efficient computation, um, but their complexity can vary. Okay. And so they, uh, what they did in, in this work is they basically constructed a toy model of, of states that look like, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of shockwave states by, by Schenk and Stanford, um, which are states, I guess, where we uh, believe in the complexity equals volume. Or complexity equals a, a quantity. Um, so they and, and their toy model looks like this. They start with thermal double state. They do a unitary. Then they insert a one-body Pauli operator, a, a same unitary one-body Pauli operator, and so on for k times. And they showed that this, in a certain setting, actually gives rise to a pseudo-random ensemble. And so that. Right, led to some puzzle because again, uh, it's, uh, so then we would sort of know because of pseudorandomness that it's hard actually to estimate given samples from such a state how many of these Pauli's did I insert, right? That's basically what we're asking. Um, uh, or even, you know, if I handed you a, a Haran state instead of one from this ensemble. Um, so uh, whereas, uh, well, volumes appear to be easy to estimate. And so th they discussed this, and I think it's a very interesting discussion to have. I'm, I'm very interested in, in people's thoughts about it. Right? I mean, there's several possibilities. Maybe complexity is not equal to volume. Um, maybe uh, these states are just too far away from what's really going on in ADCFT. Uh, but it could also be that the dictionary is kind of difficult to compute, and that's why there's no, there's no tension, okay? Because somehow as you transition from the bulk to the boundary perspective, maybe that's uh, where you have to pay. So I, that, that's, yeah, that's maybe a short summary of I'm not so sure some of what I was uh, going to, to mention. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I had an outsider question. Is there an information theoretic perspective on the presence of a bulk light cone 
you know, if you have a piece of space-time, you might expect there to be a structure of a light cone. Is there a natural language for that in the quantum information picture? And if if there isn't, can you systematically approach something like a light cone in this language? Yeah, so, so maybe I, I should say, I, I guess I, I, I was going to say something in that direction before and when, when talk about tensor networks and space-time. Lots of the models, I mean, the, the models I, I presented basically, right, they, they didn't have time really, they just had space. Um, so sort of maybe that question would go out to these specific models. There's other models that do have some kind of notion of time, uh, like the well, like the the one that we used at the very beginning to derive in quotes a page curve or what Daniel discussed. But I guess there's not really geometry uh, in the bulk, right? The bulk is somewhat unstructured. It's just like qubits that that flow out. And I hope you would agree. Uh, okay, he, he kind of agrees. I think it doesn't have a microphone in any case to disagree. Um, so so that's one answer. I guess the other answer, if you just ask for what are the kind of diagnostics that you compute, I, I mean. I, I think I would just yeah look at things like like commutators for example right or, or sort of correlators that you know like for example how you diagnose Lee Robinson bounds um, the way you formulate Lee Robinson bounds against matter theory which are effective light cones uh, I'm not sure if that's particularly quantum information of a concept. Um, but that's one thing one could do. Um, I mean, I should maybe also say, uh, to, to give justice to some, some, some people's work, where people have tried extending um, this tensor network idea also uh, by laying out space-time networks, uh, kind of where the tensors are somehow, uh, yeah, they sort of treat these directions in a different way. Um, so there one can also look at things like correlations that, that involve different times. Um, but yeah, maybe that's just, maybe it's more discussion for, for afterwards. If that's, Sorry, hopefully that okay. it's partly satisfying. So in, is it, yeah, okay. in, in the, most of the review, you talked about bipartite entanglement. And I was just wondering if you would like to comment in the spirit of toolkit offered by QI on the role of multipartite entanglement. Mm. Yeah, uh, multi-party entanglement, uh, it's, it's a difficult concept. I mean, all, even ignoring uh, uh, holography, um, uh, I mean, um, sort of an intermediate ground towards multi-party entanglement would be to look at bipartite entanglement of mixed states. That's, uh, and, and even there, somehow, we are lucky, we're lacking very sharp tools. So well, typically what we have, um, and I think that's also true for multi-party entanglement, is either we have things that we know how to compute, but they're less operationally meaningful as you would like, or there's quantities that are operationally meaningful by definition, but they're really hard to evaluate. And then there's lots of bounds known between those. But so for, uh, to give you a concrete example, right? So for example, if you measure entanglement of mixed states, uh, let's say it's just paper mixed states, right? So it's a, there's a tripartite multipart entangled state. I'll, I'll shut up in 30 seconds. Um, then, uh, you know, you can compute things like entanglement negativities um, uh, and other kind of quantities, but they're not directly equal to any, you know, meaningful rate uh, that, that you would, I mean, they have an interpretation, but it's less nice than I would like. But if you ask a question such as, you know, given a, given a mixed state, how many max entangled pairs can you extract? Uh, what's the rate or how, what's the rate at which you need entanglement to build that state, uh, that's really hard to compute. And I feel there's, there, there's a little bit this tension. So you can kind of, uh, I, I mean, maybe it's a bit of a one-dimensional answer, but I feel like uh, we don't have a completely satisfying overview, even of the structure of uh, mixed state entanglement and particularly multiparty entanglement. Or maybe one could also say it's much richer than pure state entanglement. So I, maybe we, we can discuss um, more because I, I'm supposed to <laughs> stay on time uh, about what is known uh, after the break. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. We could have one further question if we want, but oh. yeah, there's, there's one. Oh, no, they, they get from the microphone. I mean, since you're offering new tools, one thing that you mentioned but didn't say much about was these one-shot things, maximum entropies and so on. Um, are we all going to have to learn about that? Well, I don't know. What are the kind of things where we have to all learn about that? It seems like we may have to. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think we, we should be learning about those. Um, and I guess, uh, uh, I suppose there's multiple contexts in which they appear. I mean, one context is indeed, um, I mean, as I understand, is sort of maybe even defining what's the right entanglement wedge for a certain problem, right? So my, it, it's actually sort of, it's a bit related maybe to the, to the previous answer. So more, if you have non maximum entanglement, kind of the, or entanglement, maybe that's not just tensor product of bipartite, pure entanglement, um, then somehow the uh, things that are equal naively are no longer equal. So for example, the amount of entanglement you need to build a state is not the same as what you can extract from it. Or maybe um, it can be the case that you, uh, you uh, 
uh, cannot say decode the whole system from one part, but you can also maybe not, uh, so, uh, well, you cannot get everything about the system from one part, but you can also cannot get the entire thing from the other part. So I think these are like, I mean, okay, I'm, okay, I'm using colloquial words, but I think that's basically what's going on, right? And then, the, for, for example, the work by, by Chris and Jeff uh, and, and others on, on uh, the, these different notions of entanglement wedge and which one to pick. So, so I, I do think it's, uh, it's an important ingredient uh, for, uh, yeah. Maybe a short answer. Thanks, yep. uh, and thanks for all the questions, and uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.